Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Chair. Greetings to yourself. Uh, greetings to the Honorable Members of the PPC, all the PT Directors General that are in the meeting, and Chief Directors, uh, support staff to both the PPC and Ministry, representatives of Minkosa that are also in the call, our media houses in attendance. Uh, thank you very much much honorable chair to afford us with an opportunity to come and give an update members in relation with the nuclear new build uh, program the in in june 2020 uh, the department of mineral resources and energy informed by decision number eight of the integrated uh, resource plan commenced with uh, preparations for nuclear uh, my apologies, Chair, nuclear building program to the extent of uh, 2,500 megawatts at the pace and scale that uh, the, the country. Successful of the new responses, responses from companies close to 80 companies. Must just highlight this point as well. We had close to 80 companies that uh, indicated their intention to participate in the RFI. However, uh, only 25 of these responded uh, positively to the RFI. Their submissions and evaluated in relation to the requirements of the RFI and the new operational MPP, SMR, the sitting and safety, financing solutions, localization and industrialization, as well as project management and related uh, conditions. Responses in the RFI were to relate to conventional uh, pressure water reactors and small modular reactors. Uh, um, and small uh, modular reactors. Some of the RFI's respondents failed to respond to either PWR or SMR and finance. And, uh, Honorable Chair and all members that we established RFI assessment uh, technical task team comprising of key and relevant stakeholders. The department convened a workshop from the 18th to the 22nd of January, 2021, where the RFI uh, task team assessed the responses received from 25 respondents. The outcome of the RFI assessment was consolidated into a report, which would in turn inform implementation strategies for the 2,500 megawatts. Now, uh, as I conclude to hand over to the DDG, uh, who is responsible for nuclear, I just want to highlight that um, the project technical tax team agreed on the assessment guidelines wherein questions emanating from the RFI were derived and various focus groups were established to focus on the following uh, key issues conventional nuclear power plants and small modular reactor technology, cost of nuclear funding and financing models, as well as ownership uh, models, project management and scheduling, localization and industrialization, as well as seating, permitting, and safety. Um, with your permission, honorable chair and honorable members, I would like to invite the deputy director general Mr. Mbambo, the head of nuclear, to take honorable members through the detailed uh, presentation. Um, over to you, Mr. Mbambo. Thank you, thank you, DG. And uh, good morning, uh, honorable chair and the honorable members, uh, colleagues, as well as the members of the public. Uh, indeed, I am supported by the 
nuclear senior management here in the presentation. Uh, we've got Mr. Katsima Porter, who's the project manager and the chief director, as well as Mr. Chitesh Kesho, who's a nuclear technology specialist, and uh, chief director Monale and chief director Ma Mahai. As uh, the, the director general has indicated, we are responding to decision number decision number eight of the IRP. I think it's important just to also inform the members that the IRP indicates that uh, post-2030, there's going to be a large decommissioning of uh, a baseload power. Uh, at that stage, the Quebec nuclear power station will be also reaching the end of its life. And as a result, the IRP then directs that there's a need to commence with the preparations for the nuclear new build program to the extent of 2,500 megawatts at a pace and a scale that the country can afford because it is a no regret option in the long term. In terms of the next slide, the next slide, that's the outline. Then in terms of uh, the, 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 the purpose, the IRP mainly, the the RFI mainly was to test and establish the market interest towards the nuclear expansion program in South Africa. Also, it was to investigate the market appetite for viable financial and funding models that could be considered for the procurement of the nuclear technology in South Africa, taking into account the pace, the scale, the, the value for money, the affordability, the ease of deliverability, and other benefits for the country. And one of the key benefits is that the localization becomes one of the important aspects of this program because the nuclear needs to make sure that it contributes to the economy of the country. Then also to enable government strategic decisions for a program going forward. Very important to highlight that it is a non-binding request for information which seeks to gather information that must assist the department to further plan the program going forward. I've already touched on the, the background with respect to the needs for the country to ensure that we start preparing for the next baseload nuclear, the next baseload capacity, given that post 2030, a large baseload will be decommissioned. I think the IRP indicates at 24,100 megawatts will be decommissioned. And as a result, it then directs that we must commence with the preparation in terms of decision number eight of the IRP. The DG has already uh, discussed when we started the, 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 the RFI, which we've issued in June, as well as uh, it closes in October uh, 2020. A, a multidisciplinary team was established uh, to ensure that we derive uh, the best uh, uh, knowledge that the, the industry has in South Africa. Next slide. In terms of uh, the responses, uh, there were 25 responses, as DG has indicated. Uh, five uh, companies uh, offered that they can uh, supply conventional uh, nuclear power reactors, uh, PWR, pressurized water reactors, and 16 of those companies uh, indicated they can supply small modular reactors, SMRs, and then 14 of the companies were offering various uh, support services to the nuclear new build. Next slide. In terms of the structure of the request for information, uh, we sought to uh, establish the, the, the experience in the nuclear industry of the various companies that were to respond with this information in terms of understanding the construction of the nuclear power plants to get to understand their experience in that area, their experience in terms of the operation of the nuclear power plants in their countries of origin or elsewhere in the world for that matter, as well as to understand the type of reactors and whether these reactors uh, have other applications that could be of uh, 
a benefit to South Africa. And one of those is uh, water desalination, knowing that we are a, a water scarce country. Then also uh, the state of readiness for deployment of these reactors, very important because as the honorable members would notice in the presentation, uh, some of the, especially most of the small modular reactors, they are currently still uh, under development. They are still uh, being demonstrated. They are still being licensed in their countries of origin. Then the funding and the financing is an important aspect, looking into the type of construct contracting as well as the ownership the structures, possibilities of what the companies have done elsewhere in the world to tie this up with the scale and the pace and the value for money that the country can afford. We needed to also test that in the market as well as collaboration. Very important to ensure that this South African participants, then the siting, the permitting as safety and the project management were also the areas that the team looked into. Uh, next slide. And then in terms of this, it's uh, the, 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 the nuclear power. In terms of uh, the response, uh, the, the companies who responded have collectively supplied over 240 of the 454 reactors that are in operation globally. When we look into this, that's uh, an overwhelming uh, response. We found that the, the different reactors that were represented uh, constituted about 53% of the global fleet of reactors that are in the world in terms of response. These then ranges in terms of the experience to the recent generation three and generation three plus reactors. And there were seven plants in operation comprising of three that were currently uh, the three design that were under design and the various others that were currently under construction. The majority of the SMRs, which are the small modular reactors, are in the design stage with the plans to be operational by 2030. This is what I've already indicated that most of these uh, small modular reactors are currently under uh, de development. Two of the SMRs are currently uh, being constructed and one is, is operational as a prototype and the other one will enter into operation as a demonstration plant in 2021. Next slide. Very important also to inform the committee that the small modular reactors are a very important uh, technology in the hybrid system because they've got other applications other than the generation of uh, electricity. Uh, what the team found is that some companies demonstrated how these technologies could be used for water desalination, synthetic fuel, and district heating. It is important to note that the SMR technologies have the load following and the peaking capability and thus could be used to complement intermittent renewables with zero uh, carbon emissions. So that's another benefit of these uh, technologies. Next slide. Uh, the SMR technology in South Africa is not uh, new. Uh, I think uh, the, the honorable members would just maybe recall that uh, South Africa has a pebble bed modular reactor technology or the PBMR that is currently under care and maintenance at ESCOM and a number of vendor companies are looking to explore this kind of uh, technology. And this is a, a high temperature gas uh, cooled reactor type. South Africa could uh, seize this moment to further explore, to collaborate with willing partners during the negotiations in the further development of the PBMR technology, which is uh, under care and maintenance. Currently, the test results indicate that the South African fuel, as, in the, as uh, illustrated here, is one of the best in the world. Next slide. The team also looked into the issue of the cost uh, of nuclear and the financing model. What are the possibilities that the market uh, pro proposes? The, co the overnight cost is the cost of a construction project 
if no interest was incurred during the construction, as if the project was a complete overnight. It's a very important indicator as to the cost of technology, of uh, uh, the nuclear technology. Of the 25 responses received, only 11 of these provided the overnight cost for the program. In addition, some vendor companies provided the levelized cost of energy, which are cost incurred during a life cycle of the plant and may include cost of uh, capital, decommissioning, fuel cost, fixed and variable operations and maintenance cost, financing cost and uh, uh, assumed utilization rate of the plant or of the asset. Next slide. This slide then uh, provide the summary to the honorable members as to what were the observations for the team in terms of the various uh, companies, what do they say could be the possible ways in which the project can be financed. If you look into the legend there, it shows green. Green means the company indicated uh, certain information of what it proposes. This could be looked into. The, the orange indicate general information was provided. So some companies will provide general information. And then when you look into red, it indicates that the, the companies didn't supply uh, this information. But what's important is to then look into what each of these various uh, permutations are and what each company was providing the information. For instance, there is export credit agents, which is a way of also of financing the, the nuclear build, wherein you've got the private or quasi-governmental institutions that act as intermediary between the national government and the exporter to issue export insur insurance solutions, uh, guarantee for financing of uh, the asset. So, so that's one, one way in which the companies were proposing this. Then you also have vendor funded in this instance, then you have a vendor that provides all the capital funding and recovers the its uh, uh, investment via the power purchase agreement. Then if you look at the sovereign or government uh, funded, that, that involves the government providing all the project funding. Then you've got co-funding, which is a government or a partner in the host country provides a portion of the total funding requirements, equity inv investment from a vendor. And then you've got also the intergovernmental agreements, which is also one of the ways in which uh, the, the, the project can be financed, wherein you've got loans or agreements signed between the finance ministers of the vendor uh, company and the host country. The project bond the bond is then issued to finance a construction of the project, which will be paid back exclusively by the flow of money that is generated by the project without recourse to other flows, uh, uh, of other flows generated by the initiator of this project. Then the last uh, option is the capital contribution, whereby the government or a strategic uh, partner in the host uh, country makes a contribution to the uh, capital cost of the project. And when we look into these uh, different, then it, it indicates which of the companies were indicating the possibility of what type of uh, financing option it can uh, provide. Uh, then looking into this, the team also sought to find out how do these uh, uh, cost ranges uh, compared to what is in the IRP in terms of the overnight cost. And it found that there's a wide range that uh, was coming out, uh, ranging from 1,470 to 9,530 USD uh, per kilowatt. And the team found that these fall within the range of the $5,000 uh, per kilowatts that is a figure indicated in the IRP. And it's very important just to also highlight to the honorable members that these figures, uh, they, 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 there's a lot of variations that uh, could uh, 
influence these figures depending on the type of the ownership of the, the asset and also looking into that some of the technologies as we've already indicated are still currently under development in particular the small modular reactors. Uh, there are some which are already commercially of the shelf designs, the PWR, which also fall within this range. And also it's very important that we inform the honorable members that the department done quite an extensive study in 2013 to determine the cost of nuclear uh, on the various projects that were constructed all over the world. And we found that uh, the cost on average falls within the 5,000 uh, US dollars per kilowatt. And so there is a correlation of the information what we have found. The next slide. Next slide, please. This slide, uh, honorable members, I won't bore you with too much of the detail, but it's important just to demonstrate to the honorable members that there are various permutations of how the contracting can be done for the, these types of capital assets, these nuclear power uh, plants, as well as the ownership uh, permutations that uh, are being done uh, here in South Africa and elsewhere in the world. And also how this can be financed, uh, looking into how the funding is, 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 is obtained and how you generate the revenue. Then uh, in terms of what the team then uh, concluded is that the proposal from a number of vendor companies included a number a nuclear uh, SPV, which is a, a special purpose vehicle funded with a debt and equity with sovereign support from South Africa to make the project bankable. Uh, in this type of model, the nuclear plant will be housed in this uh, special purpose vehicle. The project will be construct, will be structured in a type of a project finance model. The project risk allocated to the party who is best to take the risk. The risk is allocated between the following main uh, uh, parties, which is a contractor, uh, which becomes an EPC, the, uh, the engineering procurement and the construction contractor an OMP contractor, which is coming from the vendor country. Next slide. The next slide, I've dealt with this one. Then the, 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 the observations is that the range of the overnight cost indicate that the overnight capital costs for the small modular reactors and some conventional power pressurized water reactors are between uh, 1,470 to nine thousand five hundred dollars per kilowatt. These values are, are within the range uh, that is used in the IRP. The IRP uses the five thousand dollars per kilowatt. Uh, some of the companies offered a vendor-funded financing model, where the private uh, consortium would have the responsibility for raising some or all of the necessary financing required for the project. And then also what the team observed was that several vendors, vendor companies offered independent ownership models such as build, own, operate, or build, own, operate, and transfer. And these are models that have been used elsewhere in the world. And these are some of what the various companies were offering as we've indicated in the previous slide with the, the schematic illustration. The next slide. The honorable members would note that we've indicated one of the areas we needed to determine uh, the state of readiness of the designs for the companies for deployment. And if we look into this uh, uh, slide, this is a, a development curve of technology. The orange, uh, circles indicate the company of the shelf designs. These are the designs that are ready, that have been constructed, that are in operation to generate electricity. And in the main, they fall in the category of the pressurized water reactors. 
the PWR. So there's uh, six of those that the, the, the team found. Then there were three that are currently at the stage of uh, being licensed as a first of a kind type of uh, designs. And these are all in the category of the small modular reactors. So three of them are in this category. And as we've discussed that one of them is a prototype and the other one is under construction and ready for demonstration by the end of this uh, year, 2021. Then the rest of the designs that were offered, and, and uh, uh, it's important just to indicate to the honorable members that these designs are at uh, different levels of design, but mainly these are small modular reactor designs that are currently uh, at a, either at a concept phase, at a detailed design, uh, as, as well as uh, then as they get matured in terms of their uh, state of readiness, they will move along the curve and in the end, they will end up at the stage where they are operating reactors, where you've got operational experiences. And these are the ones that South Africa should focus on uh, in order to make sure that we can uh, construct these power plants and be able to mitigate the risk of uh, the, the, the electricity supply gap that is envisaged when there is a large decommissioning of the uh, uh, base load power plants. The, on the far right of the presentation, what I have discussed is that some of the companies offered to provide various services to the uh, nuclear program. Uh, those green ones supporting the nuclear programs and then 11 and 16, those are the ones that offer to supply uh, nuclear fuel services to the program. Uh, number 12, 17, 2 and, and 24, they were proposing that they would want to be subcontracted into the program. These are not then supplying the technology into the program rather than the services. Uh, let's move to the next slide. This slide then becomes important in terms of demonstrating to the honorable members the state of readiness of the various designs. And in particular, the small modular reactors, which we've discussed. If you look into this illustration here, as, as I've indicated already, there's only two uh, small modular reactors that are proceeding towards getting to commercialization there's uh, number E as well as F. F is a prototype reactor. Uh, e is a demonstration. And the rest, as I've discussed with the honorable members, where we've, the team saw, a lot of them lie at the still concept phase. And that we can indicate there's a designs that are still far off from being commercialized. It will take a number of years to go through the iterations, to go through being licensed by their regulator in their countries of origins until they have proved their safety case. Uh, basic designs, that's where now some of them were and then detailed design, and then they move to experimental re reactors uh, and getting to commercial. And if the honorable members note, in terms of the development uh, trajectory, these uh, designs, it takes about 15 to 20 years to develop a nuclear reactor right up to a commercial phase. So very important to uh, note that, that this is where, what we saw the state of readiness of these technologies. Next slide. Then the team uh, look into the program timelines. Having noted what the, the state of readiness of the various technologies is, then the team that noted that the, 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 the program must provide the option that can guarantee the, the, the deployment of the 2,500 megawatts in the early 2030s. And these uh, should be the type of the pressurized water reactors, which are commercially off the table of the shelf designs that are available that are currently under operations. Uh, the funding model must make uh, an option of uh, accessibility into the various uh, funding instrument 
uh, that we've demonstrated in the slide previously. Then the developmental status of the small modular reactor and the possibility of fleet benefit. Uh, very important that as South Africa, we also consider the small modular reactor because that's what the IRP is also providing. These have got an IP intellectual property to South Africa ownership and the supply options. So the team then uh, advised or recommended that going forward because the capacity that's allocated to nuclear is, is 2,500. None of the technologies uh, fits into this uh, uh, capacity uh, in terms of using just one type of technology. So we will have to look into a combination of the pressurized water reactors as well as a portion to the, and the, this is what the timeline is indicating. Very important to uh, note that that's to start as early as now with the preparation because what we saw as part of the responses from the various companies is that it takes about two years to start the commercial process and as well as concluding it because of the complexity of this type of technology. Then it takes about six to 10 years uh, to, for construction until the commissioning of the first unit to the grid to supply electricity. And the, the units then get uh, spaced apart with about two years. So that's the indication that the team uh, indicated is the way in which the program would need to be looking to going forward. Then in terms of the small modular reactors, they also provided the timeline there in terms of estimating. You start with the putting the request for a proposal, then you, the licensing of the first of a kind, and the team was proposing that because these are still at the developmental stage, very important that they need to be demonstrated in the countries of origin. And then in terms of the constructions, these are a small modular reactors and therefore they've got a relatively shorter timeline of construction, four to six years and spacing them apart two year, first unit and then the next unit get followed by the next one within two years. And then as the program is roll over going forward, there's learning rates, there's experience that is acquired time between the units get reduced to be within one year. Next slide. Next slide, please. Next slide. On the summary, uh, honorable members, then uh, the, the, the team observed that fewer vendor companies have proposed a project schedule with timelines, but there was limited information that was provided, which we've just uh, indicated. We needed that information in order to understand the, 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 the benchmark in terms of the timeline. And it was noted that it would take up to 10 years to construct and operate a pressurized uh, nuclear uh, installation. And these are commercially off the shelf designs that are currently under operations. A much shorter time for small modular reactors to construct, but the licensing is protracted. Very important to also emphasize this point because these types of reactors that are currently under development in their countries of jurisdictions, they are still at the stage where they have to prove the safety case to their regulators and until such time that the regulators have approved that these reactors uh, can be commercially uh, uh, constructed they will still have to go through that process. And even when they come to South Africa, the, our regulator in South Africa will also have to satisfy itself to exercise its regulatory uh, mandate in terms of licensing these power, these power plants. Most of the companies, especially the local companies, are interested in offering support services to the nuclear new build. We've already discussed this. Uh, then the commitment to localization will be even much more clearer during the procurement negotiations. We've already indicated that, that uh, localization is an important uh, element of this uh, program. Most of the vendor companies are willing to collaborate with local 
companies or on conventional uh, island and uh, balance of plant. Uh, and uh, they, they were demonstrating various uh, local content at which they can uh, offer to South African companies for the program to make sure that it contributes to the economy of the country and it creates uh, jobs into the country. Then what the team uh, observe is that the EPCM, which is an engineering procurement construction and management seems to be the preferred mode of the contracting as proposed by some of the vendor companies. The next slide. The next slide, honorable members, then provides the overall conclusion of uh, the team having look into what the responses were from these uh, companies. The team observed that an option to build a large uh, power pressurized water reactors, which is commercially of the shelf uh, reactors with a package of uh, SMRs that can be deployed inland can be considered. That's what we've already uh, discussed in terms of that roadmap uh, that shows that we will, South Africa will have to consider a combination uh, of commercially of the shelf designs, as well as uh, small modular reactors, which are of a long-term development nature to industrialize South Africa. This will provide South Africa an opportunity to close the gap on the electricity demand per the IRP 2019 post 2030. Whilst the majority of the SMRs are developed and will be commercialized around 2030. Very important, uh, initially I indicated that the IRP indicates that post 2030, there will be a large decommissioning of uh, base load power uh, around 24,100 uh, megawatts, which various technologies for base load will need to close the gap in terms of making sure that there is a mix that is supplying the base load. And therefore nuclear becomes a very important component of that base load and the preparations of the nuclear new build uh, have to begin now because of the long lead item or the long lead project nature of the nuclear technology. Then the development of the SMRs by most vendors is still at the design and the demonstration. NNR, which is a national nuclear regulator, will need to be engaged early in the development. And that's a point that the team is highlighting here that these small modular reactors, because they still have to prove their safety case in their countries of origins and be demonstrated for commercial viability. When South Africa considered them, they will need to be an engagement with the, the regulator for licensing purposes and the understanding. Uh, the team uh, concluded that innovative financing options were proposed in 500 megawatts of a nuclear new build program that may not require upfront investment by state, especially noting that most of the project development is at an advantage of the team. The next slide. Following the, the request for information, the department will then develop an optimal implementation strategy and make recommendations for government to take key uh, strategic decisions around how to plan the program going forward. There is sufficient market appetite to develop the nuclear new build in South Africa. Uh, I think the team observed that from the responses and we've also indicated uh, around 53% of the global fleet of reactors were represented by the responses. Uh, all the bidders or companies that demonstrated their confidence in South Africa as an investment destination for the nuclear new build program. The nuclear new build program provides a huge opportunity for investment into the South African economic reconstruction and recovery plan. In terms of the localization of the program, the industrialization component, the job creation potential, which most of the uh, companies that responded indicated the willingness to partner with South Africa, uh, South African companies in, uh, in dealing with the program. Uh, 
I would like to thank uh, the honorable members. That's the end of the presentation. Uh, I would like to thank you uh, for all. Thank you very much, uh, uh, DDG, um, honorable chair and honorable members. Uh, that is actually the presentation that we have prepared and it has been uh, presented successfully to the honorable members by the DDG. Over to you, honorable chair. Thank you, thank you, DG. Uh, uh, thank you for, and uh, Marcus, for the presentation. Uh, honorable members, I have got no intentions to, to influence, but uh, I will still have to reserve my comments. Maybe I'll be proven that I'm correct. Let me check the hands. I see Honorable Mailem. I see Honorable Zungula. Uh, please keep your name because I'm trying to get a pen here. Uh, if I get it, Honorable Zungula. Then uh, there's Honorable Lorima. There's Honorable Matogwe. Uh, there's Honorable Volmarans. Then there will be Honorable Malinga. So Honorable uh, Mailem, Honorable Zungula, Honorable uh, Lorema, Honorable Matogwe, Honorable Volmarans, Honorable uh, um, Malinga. Okay. You can continue, Abdullah. Uh, Thank you, Chair. After Chair. you, after after you, I won't come in. Honorable Zungula, you will go in. If you just finish and say full stop, then Honorable Zungula will continue. Honorable Lorima in that fashion, except if I interject, that will be the only time. Thank you, Chairperson. I've got a lot of questions here. Um, so I'll try and get through them as quickly as I can. Uh, first of all, thank you, DDG, for the presentation. It was most informative. Um, my very first question is, what do you see the role of ESCOM in the nuclear new build, uh, given their current financial situation and uh, their, their difficulties in, in uh, Madupi and Kusile? What do you see their role going forward? The second is, over the weekend, we've heard a fair amount about the uh, nuclear waste disposal liability that uh, ESCOM has on their books, but don't actually have cash that they, they are transferring to uh, the National Radioactive Waste Disposal Institute. And has that been factored in to the costs? Um, if not, what process would you look at? And would you look at uh, ring fencing that funding so that it's, it's actual physical investment cash that is on your waste disposal? The second part of that question is, would you look at um, speeding up the high-level waste disposal element at fall pits, which is only scheduled to come online in 2050? So what, what would you do to, to make that uh, a realistic uh, solution in the short term? My third question relates to small modular reactors. Um, and I note that there are only two plants, uh, I, I, there's some discussion about this in the in the sector, but the, the two that are furthest ahead appear to be the Chinese and uh, the Americans. Um, but the the demo plant, what is the time frame from a demo plant being constructed and operational to commercialization? In other words, how long would it take from, now we've got a demo plant that's up and running, how long would it take from, from then to getting to an operational, to a commercialization stage that could be sold uh, and deployed around the world. Uh, I note, sorry, Chair, there seems to be some noise. Uh, so my, my next question relates to pebble bed modular reactors. 
uh, or to the pebble bed modular reactor program in South Africa. And you indicated that there was some interest in uh, partnering with South Africa or there were possibilities of partnering with South Africa to resuscitate some of that technology. What cost would be associated with that? What would happen? Uh, what would what would need to happen for that to take place? Have the have we still got the skills to do that? Have we not lost a lot of those skills to uh, other countries? Um, I'm then very curious about the the estimated time frame from from now until operationalization of uh, any nuclear new build. Um, specifically, when would you look at procuring? When would you look at at uh, going online? And while we're on that that subject, how do the the and I wish the minister was here to answer this question. How do you align the fact that in the minister's performance agreement he has committed to procuring 2,500 megawatts of nuclear new build in or by 2024, when the IRP makes no provision for procurement uh, of nuclear new generation. It only makes provision for 1,860 megawatts of life extension at Kuburg. Um, question about what sites you are considering and what the status is of those sites, whether you have to go through uh, new uh, identification and environmental processes and uh, the like. Uh, you, you mentioned that one of the, the hiccups for small modular reactors is licensing and that there's a, uh, a protracted licensing process. And I'm really concerned that there is no uh, defined global regulatory environment that people are still feeling the, their way around small modular reactors. So what exactly would we be looking at uh, in terms of that? How long are we talking for the regulatory process? Would South Africa uh, not be effectively acting as the guinea pig for the rest of the world if if we uh, go down that route? A couple more questions. Um, in slide on on slide nineteen, you, you you if I can just pull it up here, just give me one second. Uh, you say. Innovative financing solution posed by the market for 2,500 megawatts of nuclear new build that may not require upfront develop, uh, investment by the state. And then it says, and this is the part that I'm most interested in, especially noting that most of the project development is at an advanced stage. What is meant by that, that last bit? What do you mean by the project development is at an advanced stage? How can it be in a, at an advanced stage when this is just an RFI? So I'd really like some clarity on that. Uh, there was also a, a slide where you talk about um, the financing options. And uh, I'm just trying to find it here. Here, on slide 12, where you talk about the nuclear special project vehicle funded with debt and equity. And then, then you say, with sovereign support from South Africa to make the project bankable. Could you unpack what you mean by sovereign support, how much sovereign support, and where we would find that given our fiscus is extremely constrained at the moment? My last question is, what would be the public participation process going forward on the nuclear, on the proposed nuclear new build, given that the last attempt to do this was stymied in the courts, primarily uh, around the lack of, of public participation in the decision-making process. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, I've got a couple of questions as well. Um, on slide five, um, were there any local bidders? If yes, can you please provide the details? On slide six, which are the local companies um, by shareholding identified to participate in the localization and what was the process of um, to obtain these companies. Then on slide eight, is ESCOM ready to um, with the interface um, between the NNB and the existing infrastructure? And uh, lastly, 
what stops a syndication of PIC and the Reserve Bank to finance the NNB so that they own African? Thank you. I've just got uh, one question which involves the decision-making process as to which partner or partners to go with. And I'd like to know if you can give us a bit more on how that decision will be made. When you're making that decision, you're obviously taking into account a number of factors, what type of reactor it is, how long it takes to build, um, and uh, what kind of fun, uh, financing you're going to organize. Another of those factors is the degree of localization. So I'd like to know, how important relatively each of these factors is, and particularly what importance you will be attaching to the issue of localization. Thank you. Mama Dog, it's your turn. Uh, thank you, Jefferson. I just had a bit of an issue. Um, I have about three questions. I think Honorable Zungula did cover one, but I'm also interested in perhaps the, the demographics of the vendor companies or the potential vendor companies, which is number one, what proportion is local? Um, what proportion is black owned? What proportion of the company's disabilities? That's one. Um, and then the second one, notwithstanding that um, the companies that will be providing the services have said that they would want to collaborate um, with local companies. But we're interested perhaps in what initiatives are there by government or the department in particular to equip and capacitate companies that fall under the demographics that I listed before uh, that do show potential um, to provide services but have not made the cut for one reason or the other. And then the third question, um, this is relating to the fact that um, a lot of the skills, a lot of the technology will be outsourced um, and outsourced even outside South Africa and I would assume that owes to skills shortage. So I wanted to find out is there perhaps or are there perhaps um, in the IRF, uh, did it um, explore um, the, uh, the possibility of, of starting like a, academic programs wherein they could actually like um, rope in like graduates like in different uh, fields and then give them the skills in a particular academic program that would meet this, I have to put, um, rely on uh, the foreign um, companies. Those are the three questions that I have, Chairperson. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Chairperson. Uh, let me take the opportunity to, to greet all the members um, uh, of the committee, the staff headed by the DG and um, all the other supporting staff members. Uh, Chairperson, <clears throat> the, the, I, I must welcome the report, which is uh, by and large uh, quite informative um, with what has been done for, uh, up to so far. I think uh, I would align myself with the questions, um, especially uh, both Mr. Mailem and uh, Zungula. Um, and I would not uh, delve much into uh, a number of issues that they have already um, uh, raised, most of which uh, Honorable Malam uh, has um, uh, dealt with. Um, maybe I must just start by asking with regard to uh, this project or this program, uh, the site identification and everything that goes uh, legislatively with uh, such site. Um, if um, th there can be expansion on whether the site has been identified um, and, and what work uh, is going around there. Um, on slide eight, um, it shows that um, uh, we, we would be interested 
or the approach that is also listed there is of uh, reactors which might be multifunctional in as far as um, the, the, the capacity um, and uh, uh, the work related is concerned, the usage. Uh, E.g., we know we are a water of care uh, uh, country and um, we had had uh, a number of problems with regard to water shortages, especially around um, the Cape province now, and there is an, uh, companies which relate to the multifunctionality of their proposal uh, regarding desalination of um, water. Uh, would, would that, if uh, we go for that concept, would it not disadvantage the inner um, <clears throat> the provinces? Where you don't necessarily have to deal with uh, desalination, or will it, uh, will it be considered to be multifunctional? Um, I want to find out as well the ESCOM issue, uh, given the background that we have around ESCOM. Uh, the, the, the envisaged uh, partnership of ESCOM or the role of ESCOM uh, with regard to the entire uh, identification, construction, and when the request was made, did ESCOM also participate or put forward um, a proposal? Uh, on the uh, numerous occasions that we have interacted with the sub, been shown that the department has considered um, some arrangements with other countries. Uh, e.g., uh, your ex uh, exchange programs uh, where capacity is supposed to be built, the buzzer programs and so on as far back as 2015. Now, with the first uh, aspect of this program being either uh, nullified or uh, affected by the court outcomes, what happens to that skills? development program? Is it still uh, on course? Are we still sending people? Um, uh, if there can be some um, expansion on, on, on that part, so that when we say we are ready, we would be having the skills required, or uh, when the high court um, um, pronounced, uh, what happens to that uh, program? Uh, the, the, the entire program from start to finish, and given the many months uh, and years that it will take, uh, I would want to find out to what extent would this program um, uh, include local industrialists, uh, and especially your previously disadvantaged, uh, or to be specific, your black industrial, uh, uh, industrialists, uh, given multiple pronouncements, both by the presidency and uh, different ministries with regards to building uh, black industrialists and uh, localization of, of a number of programs. To what extent does, uh, would this program uh, support those initiatives? I think the chairperson, I, I would um, uh, pause as many of the issues have been uh, picked up by my fellow uh, honorable members. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Chairperson. Greetings to yourself, members of the Portfolio Committee and uh, the invitees and the DMRE staff led by Mguena, also our table staff. Chairperson, let me welcome the report as presented by DDG Mbambo. Indeed, Chair, my colleagues have said a mouthful. But Chairperson, just uh, two or few issues. I just want to check who, who will own this plant because I, I, I'm not sure if I, I captured that DDG. Uh, who, we, who, who will have uh, the shareholding rights on this plant? Are we, are we taking the, the triple P route or will it be a state-owned um, uh, entity? Chairperson, they say out of the 80, only 25 responded. I want to check from the 25, if the, the 25 companies that have showed appetite meet the triple PEE norm. 
uh, chair uh, is 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 the the will we have this plant running by 2030 given the 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 that we are currently in 2021 uh, and what ddg has outlined to be the process in constructing this nuclear plant let me submarine the chair thank you very much Honorable Chair. Hello, Chair. Okay, I'm lost. Yes, DG. Can you can you get an answer, please? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. I would like to invite uh, DDG Mbambo. Uh, together with his team. I'm sure he will delegate um, during the proceedings who would respond to which question. Um, over to you, uh, Didi Jimbambo. Uh, thank you very much, uh, DG and the honorable members for the questions. Uh, honorable members, uh, the, there was lots of questions uh, I would deal with some of them and others I will request that my team uh, also make their inputs the, in terms of response. Uh, if there's some that perhaps I will miss, uh, the team would uh, deal with those. Uh, but let me start with the issue of uh, uh, ESCOM raised by the Honorable Member Milam. The role of ESCOM, uh, we see that role still as an important in terms of uh, the buyer of electricity, ESCOM will need the, 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 the power. Uh, in, at a, lay, at a, stale, a stage of uh, developing the program, the commercial part of it that is being led by the department and going forward, the various uh, will then be engaged in terms of how they participate into the different roles. I think what is important is to highlight that at this stage, the department is at a stage where it's investigating what are the possibilities of implementing this program. At this stage, they we're looking into the various options has been presented here, and all of these will then be weighed up in terms of the pros and cons uh, of how best the state can uh, deal with this program taking into account the, 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 the balance sheet of the utility, the balance sheet of the state, what would be the best approach that will make the program uh, financeable and workable. And that is why it's very important that at this stage, the department takes the leadership, government leads the program in terms of developing and coming up at the final uh, possibilities that could be considered for this program. Then uh, there was an issue raised around the nuclear waste liability, whether this is going to be ring fenced. I think this is an important element uh, that we should deal with. Uh, in terms of the industry norms, is that when the plant is operational, there is also an issue of putting aside the decommissioning funds that will ensure that in the long term, when the, the plant is decommissioned, there is no need to put a, a lot of upfront investment. The investment has already been made. And uh, that, that's what we've discussed when we were discussing about the, 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 the levelized cost of energy, that it includes these particular elements. It includes the operational cost, it includes the decommissioning cost, it includes uh, the fuel cost, the maintenance cost, when the plant uh, is being assessed in terms of what it will cost. And ESCOM also has been doing this. They've got the decommissioning funds that they are setting aside these funds. Uh, in terms of it being ring-fenced uh, to NRAD, very important to just uh, indicate to the honorable members that NRAD 
or which is the National Radioactive Waste Disposal Institute is, is, is a, an entity of the state whose mandate will manage the high level waste in the long term. And also the department is uh, at uh, an advanced stage in terms of uh, processing the bill that will ensure that we can manage the, the long term management of the high level waste, which is a fund bill. So that process is at a, an advanced stage. But very important also is to indicate that South Africa has a, 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 a national waste repository site, which is a Valput uh, in the Northern Cape and the Honorable Member Milam uh, correctly point out is then raise the issue whether we looking into speeding up the initiatives for storage of the uh, high level waste at Valput. What is important is to highlight to the committee also that NRAD has been designated as the implementer of the central interim storage facility, which is a project that is intended to ensure that there's temporal storage of the radioactive waste. And the NRADI is now busy uh, developing the pre-feasibility study for this project, which is uh, uh, designed to make sure that we have a safe storage uh, for the high level waste in the interim and in the long term in future, that's when they will be investigating as in terms of their mandate, the, 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 the long term disposal uh, facility for the high level radioactive waste, which is a deep geological repository, which is the work that NRADI is seized with in terms of their investigation. And so there are uh, uh, processes in place that the country is dealing with. An intermediate waste is currently stored at Varput safely. Uh, so there is that process. Then the time from the demonstration uh, to commercialization, I will request uh, Mr. Kesho, the nuclear technology specialist, to deal with that one. Uh, then the cost of partnership with uh, the various uh, parties that were interested in looking into uh, the pebble bed modular reactors, whether the country still has got the skills and all of that. On the issue of the skills, yes, I can uh, confirm that South Africa still has a lot of uh, nuclear professionals which were part of the PMR and we see them uh, applying their skills in various uh, jurisdictions all over the, the world because of the CMR. We were the lead of South Africa into that area and there are still uh, experts that are in the country that are also applying their uh, uh, knowledge in this uh, part of technology. So there is sufficient uh, nuclear professional skills that were part of the PBMR. And also when it comes to what is the cost and all of that, I think it's very important just to highlight that this will be determined at the stage of negotiation of uh, different parties to determine how the partnership can be structured and what the cost implication and so on and so forth. So, so that, that, that we would leave it at that stage, it, it can be assessed. Uh, by the different parties. The plan for the procurement, when uh, do we plan to procure and uh, all of that. The Honorable Member Mailem raised that in terms of the Minister's performance uh, agreement, it, there's a commitment of 2024, uh, which is a year which it's envisaged that the procurement needs to have been completed. Uh, and that is, is, is correct in terms of the, 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 the department strategic plan, it projects that by 2024 plan that the procurement you build the 2,500 megawatts uh, should have been completed. And that is still the plan of the government that we are pursuing. This work is all driven towards making sure that we realize that uh, 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 commitment uh, to make sure that the work is, begins because all the work that we've indicated here uh, can only be uh, taking place after a commercial decision 
has been dealing with a non-commercial binding RFI, which helps to provide information for the department, for the government, for further planning of the program. That's how long and uh, which sites are being considered. I think it's very important, and, and this will link up with the question that the, the honorable member was asking to say the, 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 the project is at an advanced stage. Very important to recognize that South Africa started the siting work as early as uh, around 2007. So there's been a lot of uh, work characterizing the sites for nuclear for nuclear power plants, uh, the environmental impact assessment for the different sites. There is a site in the Eastern Cape that they spent, which was studied quite extensively by ESCOM. There is also a site in the Quebec, uh, Dynafontaine, which was studied quite extensively. And that work is still ongoing. So there's, in, in our view, sufficient information that has been uh, gathered in terms of understanding uh, the characteristics of the site that could be potentially be used for uh, siting a nuclear power plant. But obviously these are still subject to regulatory approvals that are still being uh, applied for and are still being considered by the regulatory authorities that are dealing with these matters, uh, such as where we are in terms of siting. But also it doesn't exclude that other sites could be uh, studied in future to determine whether they will be suitable for siting of the nuclear power plants. The global licensing regime for the SMRs, how long does it take uh, to license this? Uh, I think it's very important that I would share the experience of what we see the regulators uh, indicating, where they indicate, because these are uh, what we call uh, new designs takes about five to six years uh, to license these, uh, depending, uh, of course, of how successful the, the designer is able to provide a, a, a safety case that proves to the regulator that the design can be uh, safely constructed and operated. So it depends. Uh, but there is also a, a, a group of uh, regulators which uh, are looking into various uh, small modular reactors uh, in the generation four, and this is called MDEC. Uh, and also then uh, the South African regulator participate into this global forum where regulators are studying the various uh, designs that are currently being considered as part of the small modular reactors. So, so that's an indicative figure we could give, say, five to six years is what it could take to license a small modular reactor. But it depends as to whether that design has proven its safety case in the country of origin. So, so that's a ballpark figure we're just providing. In terms of the, the other question that the honorable member raised, the project is at an advanced stage, slide number seven. It clearly speaks to the issue we've already discussed that in terms of preparation for the nuclear new build in South Africa, there's a lot of work that has been done over the past, say, 10 to 12 years in terms of the various aspects of the, the project, the feasibility, and to the various elements. And all of this work is then uh, supporting the, 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 the finalization of making technical recommendation. At a technical level, these have, have already been thoroughly studied. Uh, going forward will be also then important to assist in uh, supporting decision making. Then uh, sovereign support, the understanding of the balance sheet of the state, I think, uh, Honorable uh, Member Malin, this uh, the team is just reporting as to the various options that uh, different companies were providing that uh, it becomes much more uh, supported to have sovereign support of the program. Uh, and these come in various forms and shapes. Normally it becomes as uh, the, the, the guarantees 
that the, 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 the vendor companies would like to get an assurance that the state uh, would provide necessary guarantees for the program uh, when the program is being deployed. But these are indicative and also it, it, it depends as to what the, 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 the regulatory regime is that is, is, is prevailing at the time. What is important to recognize for honorable members is that we're dealing with the nuclear uh, technology, which is a future technology. We're looking into 10 years down the line and the regulatory framework down the line could possibly be changed quite completely. Uh, and it may have uh, various possibilities that uh, furthermore uh, mitigate uh, potential for the state uh, to provide guarantees. It depends on how the electricity market is, is, is structured in the country and all of this. This is just one example. There's many other examples that the stakeholders, the, 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 the vendor companies were providing as to how South Africa may look into this. It's, it's not one uh, options. That's why we've presented that uh, illustration that provides that the various permutations which we're going to study and for government to take strategic decisions on taking the program forward. So it's not meant to indicate that it's going to burden the state balance sheet in terms of immediately requiring the sovereign support. It's an indication. Then public participation uh, is a very important component of uh, 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 any infrastructure project. And these are defined by the various legislation entities for regulatory purposes. So the areas where normally uh, public participate into this infrastructure project is the EIA, Environmental Impact Assessment, where there's extensive consultation with the stakeholders and they provide their input. And also when it comes to the nuclear licensing process, this also uh, provide uh, an opportunity for the public to participate when the, the national nuclear regulator has to take its own decisions around the project. And also there's also an, the public participation, which is a process led by NERSA, uh, the, the National Energy Regulator of South Africa. And that also becomes a, a, a process that allows for the public participation in the program. So all of these are, are possible uh, legislated processes that allows for public participation. And this program will go through those processes. And, and indeed, right now, the, 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 the NERSA is, is currently busy with its public hearings, and this is part of public uh, participation that is, uh, that is uh, accommodated by the legislation. Then, uh, Honorable Zungula, the issue of localization slide number five, it's a very important uh, component of the nuclear new build. Uh, the nuclear energy policy of South Africa indicate that South Africa wants to become self-sufficient in all the value chain for the nuclear new build for peaceful purposes. And that's an area that as we're dealing with the program, we are closely monitoring, we are testing the market to understand the extent to which they will make sure that South African companies would uh, localize. So it's a very important element of the program. The role of ESCOM, I think we've already discussed that, that is an important uh, uh, entity of the state. It will need power. It it's also would be uh, supporting government initiative as we are busy dealing with the program. So it's very important to recognize ESCOM uh, as, as, as a party into this uh, development. The syndicate of PIC to fund the program, what would it stop that? Uh, to have uh, the investors from South Africa. I think it's an issue that uh, it's open, uh, which will be dealt with uh, going forward when the program gets into a commercial phase as to how the different structures uh, get uh, put together on how the program can be uh, financed. It will depend into uh, the model that will finally be 
uh, accepted for South Africa to proceed with the program and how uh, the, the, the parties then get involved. Uh, Honorable Lorima, what, uh, how do we look into the different aspects of the program as we've outlined them in the RFI, the relative importance of all of these in different degrees, but uh, all of them play a key pivotal role in this, in enable us to understand what the, the market offers out of there. Uh, uh, the, 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 the localization of correctly pointed what value do we put into this very important uh, uh, to localize the program because like we've said we want to participate into the entire nuclear value chain and so it will play quite a, a pivotal role because it must industrialize in terms of the, the the local content these we will expect that they must be in line with uh, the, 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 the policies of the country with regards to infrastructure, local content that's required to be attained when these projects of this nature are being uh, executed in the country. Uh, Honorable uh, Madogwe, in terms of the demographics for the local companies that participated, uh, the, these, these varied uh, uh, in terms of what the demographics, and I think maybe the team could uh, reflect on this. I'm not sure if we, we were going to the level of now analyzing the demographics, but that's an area that perhaps we will need to look quite closely as we are busy uh, finalizing this, uh, the, 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 the reports into looking into what the demographics are and, and all of that. We agree, it's a very important uh, element that needs to be looked into in the program. The it is to start making sure that the country has sufficient, um, very important, and uh, we need to indicate that when we were busy with the nuclear program, there were various uh, programs where various professionals were going into different countries to study nuclear, nuclear engineering, and the, those initiatives are still continuing. Uh, various students are still studying in different uh, areas uh, to make sure that we're ready for this. And also, there is in South Africa uh, quite an extensive academic program for nuclear uh, training. Various universities are offering uh, degrees for uh, nuclear engineering at a postgraduate level for nuclear uh, masters in nuclear science at various uh, postgraduate uh, level. So there is a program and we would be as part of planning the program, also making sure that we, we deal with the issue of skills development. Then uh, Honorable uh, Volmarans, uh, the site uh, identified uh, one in terms of some of the sites the, where the extensive work has already been done. We've indicated there was a, there a site in Denefontein next to Quebec uh, that there's advanced work for the EIA that is still being dealt with by the Environmental Affairs Department. There's also uh, they span the site that is in the uh, quite extensively studied, uh, but also the other options for studying other sites, even inland, and these can still be studied going forward. And then water desalination, whether this would not be disadvantaging to the inland uh, uh, provinces in terms of having to consider to locate the nuclear power plants along the coast. Uh, in our view, uh, we, the, we, we, we think this would not disadvantage the, 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 the inland provinces in terms of having the ability to host some of these uh, nuclear power plants because the, 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 although nuclear power plants require a lot of uh, water for cooling and they normally get located along the coast, uh, some of the nuclear reactor designs can be located inland 
uh, they, they need the cooling towers uh, to be able to, to cool off. Uh, they also need uh, maybe the, the, the river source as part of the cooling uh, and the heat sink uh, system. So it would not disadvantage the inland province. They still a potential that sites can still be studied inland uh, and they can be potential sites for uh, nuclear power plants, especially the small modular reactors. Skills development initiatives, I think we've touched on this. This is a, a key area to make sure that we have sufficient uh, capacity to host and also take over the program as South Africa. And these initiatives are still ongoing. Uh, various professionals are still being trained. Uh, the extend support the black industrialists uh, very important, uh, uh, the honorable uh, member Volmaran, and we've highlighted this is a, an important, it's a policy uh, prescript of nuclear as well as the policy uh, prescript for the country. And uh, going forward, when we go into further development of the program, we're putting up a, a transformation strategy for the program, and this will then be assisting to ensure that there is a dedicated strategy that seeks to address the issue of localization, the participation of black industrialists in line with the country's policy. So that's very important. And this is what we will be looking into uh, ensuring that this area is, 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 is active in the program. Then uh, honorable member Malem, who will, honorable member Malinga, who will own the plant, whether the companies that responded uh, meet the BEE uh, requirements. Uh, I think these are areas that will be uh, studied going forward. In terms of the ownership, uh, what we've demonstrated here, we were studying the various permutation because we acknowledge that we in the different uh, space in terms of the, 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 the strength of the balance sheet of, of the utility. And so we're studying all permutation and in the final analysis, we'll make a recommendation of which will be the optimal ownership structure that will ensure that the, the, the government can uh, own the plant uh, and it doesn't uh, burden the state upfront in terms of the, the initial investment that's required. And so we'll study all the different uh, permutation, the ownership structures as we've illustrated in the presentation, look into the international benchmarks, what the possibilities, and we'll engage quite extensively into that. And then that will then be the indication of the ownership that will be appropriate for South Africa. And that will be one of the areas that will also be looked into going forward. Then the, 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 the BE component of the companies that responded, very important. Uh, mainly, it's very important to indicate to the committee that nuclear vendor companies are mainly international companies. And as a result, in terms of their BE status and all of this, I think that's an area that we'll be looking to quite extensively going forward into the commercial process in terms of how they uh, partner with the local black industrialists and how they then comply with the requirements. But in our view, we will be making sure that all the, 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 the country's requirements, when it comes to the BEE requirements, are complied with uh, to make sure that the program benefit the South Africans uh, in terms of it being uh, localized. And we've also have, uh, as part of the cross multidisciplinary team that we've indicated in the slides, we've also got the, D, the DTIC, uh, which is the, the Department of Trade Industry uh, 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 and the co competition that also is part of this. And also in the development of the different uh, strategies of the program, we had already started developing the localization strategy for the program. And this is going to be then look into going forward to make sure that we can finalize on that one. So I think I have covered uh, a lot of the questions. If I miss some others, uh, the team will respond into them. Let me request Mr. Kesho just to 
re reflect on the question that was asked, how long does it take uh, from a demonstration power plants to a commercial power plants? If you could make that input, Mr. Kesha. Good morning, <clears throat> honorable members. Good morning, uh, DG. Uh, good morning, DDG. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I had some connection problems earlier. Um, the question asked was, how long does it take the demo plant to become a commercial plant? So uh, the criteria we applied was quite conservative because a lot of the vendors might claim they have a commercial plant and they have this uh, criteria we use is two things. Firstly, the plant must operate commercially and sell electricity to the grid within specification of what it was set to operate. So that can take between two to three years uh, for a plant to show this. And secondly, the plant, and these can be, a, the plant must be sold as a commercial offering uh, through a binding offer to uh, a customer. So let's say, uh, I'm just gonna give you a timeline. This is a minimum of three years from the demo plant that you see there can become a commercial plant when it's demonstrated uh, to operate commercially and also uh, sold as a commercial offering um, to another customer. That's basically it. And then I just wanted to talk about this concept of um, guinea pig quickly, just to say that um, we should understand that innovation and guinea pig are two of the same and there's two ways of looking at it. If you want to innovate and move forward um, as an economy and a country, then you have to bite the bullet and, and we, we won't take a risk of uh, being a guinea pig because South Africa has vast experience in nuclear technology. We, uh, we were the, one of the pioneers in terms of development of radioisotopes uh, to the international market and also in terms of uh, converting our reactors from high, re high enriched uranium to low enriched uranium. So um, we, are, we are not a guinea pig in the nuclear space. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, DDG Mbambo and your team. Um, Honorable Chair, I would like to hand over to you. Um, those are the responses, I think, uh, detailed uh, in replying uh, to the questions uh, you know, from honorable members. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, thank you, DG. Uh, I see your hand, Honorable Malam. I'm sure you want to make a follow up. Uh, let me check to those who have not spoken before. Um, Look, uh, I'll come back to you, Honorable Maile, I see your hand. DG, um, uh, good morning, morning, uh, uh, Chair. Uh, and, uh, Saubona, Prof. Uh, Simang, I see that uh, you are finally in. Welcome to this committee. We are looking forward to your fruitful and productive contribution in the discussion. Uh, you are welcome uh, in this uh, in this committee. What I see is here. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Yes, um, I am new. This is the second. I find uh, the discussions to be very interesting and very much on a high level. Therefore, I'm still finding my feet. And uh, today I will pass, I, do, I think I'm covered by the questions by all my colleagues. Thank you very much. Okay, Prof. Look. <clears throat> I, I, I listened to the, I, I said I'll come to Honorable Melam on the follow up. I'm not sure whether they will be able to answer the other question that uh, you, you, you had asked in terms of the key performance country on the performance contract uh, that the minister has and uh, on what uh, 
is the target in relation to the issues that relates to, to nuclear. <clears throat> the, the difficulty, let, let me first explain. You see, when you are sitting as a chair, you, you may have difficulties. And uh, please accept my apology if I confuse you members. My, my first problem is a principal matter. Maybe I don't understand. That's why I'm saying, let me clarify this confusion. The, 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 at the center of this is the, is the principle of nuclear in terms of the IRP uh, process, which uh, says that uh, it will be audited at the pace, scale, in which the country can afford. Now, <clears throat> it's easy sometimes to take things. I'm not sure whether I said the pace and scale in which the country can afford comparatively to something. Or is that the pace and scale to which some divine or, or, or authoritative decision is made? that it can be affordable. I'm, I'm, that's why I'm saying the confusion must be clarified by me, because I assumed at some point that when we say at the pay scale um, to which the country can afford, comparative to other, to say, if we go this route, then um, it will assist us in terms of this other route. Now, I, 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 that's why I'm saying, if you're with me, uh, that, uh, I did not understand the, the, the meaning. So if someone now asks and say, is, does the state say we have now reached that point that uh, the state can afford? Uh, so I please clear my confusion. Secondly, in the presentation, including the six month period of license issuing, and all these other all other exercises. Surely the, the, the rate or the cost is must be factored in. Now I was sitting here saying that if something is gonna happen as far as uh, beyond uh, six years, it means that this committee might be sitting here taking a decision where some of us or most of us, if not all of us, will be long gone from this committee or to parliament. And it becomes a baby of those who, who, who would be uh, supposedly taking decisions. I'm saying this because I've seen experience in the in government, in the public sector, where decisions are taken, cost, are just general on the basis of assumption. Now, if for instance, the licensing regime could change at any given moment, um, shouldn't the plead from the onset be the one that says, look, we are just giving a progress report. There are certain things that we need to be certain. That is where to me the principle of accountability comes in. Because in most of these areas, there are gray areas, especially at the, at the, at the extent of cost implications. I, I can't get clarity where there is definite and confidence that uh, if we do this and that, in terms of our uncalculated cost, this would be this extent. I'm not saying, so, so, so I'm saying with all the, the experiences we've had, including the question of escalations, we have not been factored in. Uh, shouldn't it be that, uh, look, we are presenting this on the basis of the progress that we are giving in, but also remember there are other role players who makes a determination on what has to be followed uh, in terms of the prescribed processes, in particular on the issues of public participation Amongst those is the is the is the is, is NERSA, but also we are looking at this on the basis that if we follow this route, the entity concerned 
that uh, is uh, is troubled by past experiences of 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 losses made um is capable how do we how, how we do we get certainty that an entity like escom as you say will be able to meet some of its obligations and responsibility that, that to me will even go to to the fact that uh, to the fact that uh, even in Radi, I'm not sure in terms of capacity. If you recall, honorable members, in our first meeting when they made a presentation, even about their site in, uh, in, in the Northern Cape, in terms of its capacity, so we, uh, in terms of its capacity, there is a potential that uh, it may not deliver the, the, the required uh, exercise. So, so, so that is where my, 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 my challenge is. But also linked to this, if I were to use a simple term uh, in terms of exercises that we were used to find in the minerals and energy space, is that should it will be correct if we say at this stage, this is a, a still at an exploratory level of, of, the, of, of the, 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 the project. And therefore, which means from time to time, as a committee of parliament, it will require close monitoring that uh, it can be closed at this stage. From time to time, I'm not saying this year or, or next quarter or what, we may have to allow and give space for a proper exercise to be, to, to be conducted consistently by the by the 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 the, 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 the committee. I'm raising this thing also because some of the areas where I would say it's where it has been fact finding exercise or missions has been the fact that uh, 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 some of the projects, even where we want to learn or see on how they they are performing, they are also at a, at a, at a, at a progress level. Not that they were complete and would say these are real and true success stories. So that is why I'm saying my, my confusion, please bear with me if I'm confusing the presentation uh, that is being made now uh, with something else that uh, I may not be understanding. I thought I must put this thing because uh, I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a critique, I'm not a, an objectionist. But I think it's important that from where we sit as members of parliament, we even know when we say, okay, this one, we think it has been, it, it, it's, it's flowing correct. Or we say this one, it's something that we cannot take off our eyes on it. From time to time, we might arrive. Now we need more detailed uh, exercise because of one, two, and three. So that is that is my 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 major concern, teacher. I hope you'll be able to clarify on that issue. Honorable Mylam, I only see your hand. I assume you want to do a follow up. Yes, please, Chairperson, and thank you very much. And 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 I, I agree with you in terms of the clarity that you're you're asking. Because my concern is this. On the one hand, we have an approved policy document in the IRP which speaks to what procurement can take place at this time. And in that policy document on, on the table that shows exactly what will be procured when, there is no new nuclear build. So the 2,500 megawatts that we're talking about here, from an exploratory perspective, from a, uh, investigative perspective, absolutely no issue with that whatsoever. However, as soon as we move to procurement, it then moves into the realm of contradicting the IRP. And so I'd really like some clarity because Mr. Mbamba was, was very clear that the ministerial performance agreement uh, does in fact commit the minister to procuring 2,500 megawatts by 2024. And that's problematic for me because the IRP does not make provision for that. So that's the first question. The second question I'd, I'd like to follow up on is 
with regard to nuclear waste disposal. And Mr. Mbambo, you, you, you basically repeated everything that I said, but you didn't answer my question. My question was this, if we are to pursue a nuclear new build, one, should we not uh, expedite the creation of high level waste disposal at fall pits? In other words, it's currently kind of projected that they will only be able to start storing high level waste or, or disposing of high level waste at fall pits from 2050 onwards. If that's the case, we shouldn't be pursuing this because essentially we're talking about on-site storage. Uh, we're talking about risk of contamination. There's a whole lot of, of issues that arise around that. So the second question that I, or the second part to that question relates to the uh, ring fencing of funds for, for nuclear waste disposal. And you did answer it to a certain extent about the uh, forthcoming nuclear waste disposable. And I'd, I'd really welcome the DG advising what the status of that draft bill is and when we can expect to have a table before committee, the, the funding bill for nuclear waste disposal. But one of the, the issues that I raised is that as far as ESCOM is concerned, the actual physical money for nuclear waste disposal does not exist. The 16 and a half billion Rand for nuclear waste disposal doesn't exist. They don't have that money. It's a liability on their balance sheet. Now we know that ESCOM is 480 billion Rand in the red. So if they were to have to uh, decommission Kuburg in 2024, because there's no life extension for argument's sake, and they were required to dispose of that nuclear waste, they would have to find 16 and a half billion Rand that they do not have. So my question is, are we going to, as part of this process, ensure that the, the nuclear waste disposal liability is actually set aside in terms of hard investment cash? In other words, every year you put aside a certain amount of money, you put it into an investment account so that the money actually physically exists and it doesn't just reflect as a balance sheet entry that the 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 opera, whoever that may be, whether it's state or private or or some combination of the two, uh, is not just reflecting it on their balance sheet, but actually has the physical cash to pay for that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, uh, DJ. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. Um, and we'll deal with the uh, other questions that um, Honorable Malam has directed to, to myself. Um, I'd like to invite Mr. Mbambo. I would add also to your questions as well, Chair. Uh, Mr. Mbambo, can you come in? Uh, thank you very much, DG, and uh, thank you very much to the honorable members of the committee and the, the clarity that the Chair is seeking I think, Chair, you, you, you're correct. You raised the question that shouldn't we be saying that at this stage, we are at a, an exploratory stage of the program. That's correct. We are at a, an exploratory stage of the program. And that is why we are here to the committee to present a progress report as to this uh, technical investigation that we are undertaking in order to determine how feasible would it be for the country to uh, deploy the nuclear new build as it is indicated in the IRP. So that's a correct assessment of the situation, Chair. And we will, uh, as the committee will uh, require, uh, update the committee as to the progress we are making in terms of this. And we've indicated upfront that the request for information is a non-binding uh, process which seeks to test the market appetite for the nuclear new build so that it can inform the government, the department in terms of what is the market thinking is the viability of the nuclear new build in South Africa. And what could be the potential uh, solutions that could be considered by South Africa 
if South Africa were to, cons to, to continue uh, with the nuclear program. As a policy principle, and you've correctly indicated, uh, Honorable Chair, that there is a policy principle that nuclear is part of the energy mix. And that is contained in the IRP 2019. And uh, honorable uh, members uh, would uh, recognize that South Africa has been using nuclear power for more than 30 years, which is generated uh, from Quebec nuclear power station in the Western Cape. And therefore it is part of the energy mix it provides clean, uh, affordable baseload power, which the country require. And as we go forward as a country, we're going into a just transition wherein the country plans to reduce the carbon, the carbon footprint of uh, different energy sources. And the IRP then uh, identify that nuclear uh, should be part of the issue here that we will require base load, and this base load has to come from clean energy sources, and nuclear provides that base load. And that's that principal issue, that's a policy. Then the next level of it is to then investigate how can this be uh, done? Is the country uh, ready in terms of whether it can afford it, uh, whether when can, the, 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 the time that is the, 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 the pace and the scale at which the country can afford this program. And that is why this investigation, because it then assists the country to understand what are the possibilities in the market. How can it be financed? Can it be financed through the, the balance sheet of the state, through the balance state of the utility, can it be financed off the balance sheet of the state by using various innovative financing mechanism? And the team found that looking elsewhere in the world and looking into the information that has been provided by the different companies, there is possibilities that the program can be financed outside the balance sheet of the state. But all of this needs to be thoroughly investigated, needs to be weighed in in terms of the pros and the cons and what the state would want to take as the appropriate mechanism to deploy the nuclear new build. The risk that we are facing as a country going forward, and I think it's very important to highlight this, is that come post 2030, when the country is going to decommissioned 24,100 megawatts of baseload power. There is a need for the country to start the preparation for baseload power plants now, recognizing that nuclear is a long-term uh, technology and, and, and also other technologies that are of a baseload nature. I mean, clean coal technologies are also relevant to make sure that there's a baseload sources that are provided and other technologies that the country is uh, committed to in terms of what is contained in the IRP. And nuclear happens to be that type of an energy technology or source that requires a lot of upfront preparations to make sure that comes the time when other plants will be decommissioned, the nuclear power plant can commission to the grid and then it can generate the electricity for the country to ensure the security of energy supply. And that's why the work has to begin now. Then the cost of the project, Chairperson, you correct. We are not at this stage providing what the cost of the project is going to be. And that's the a thorough assessment that we will do based on all of this work that we have conducted. And there are various uh, stakeholders which you correctly pointed out that will carry out their different uh, functions as per their mandate. They are regulators, nuclear regulator, the, the, the NERSA, 
there is uh, ESCOM, there is NRADI, there is uh, NEXA, which are all key uh, state entities that have got particular roles that they play in the area of the nuclear program. And these will further be defined uh, in future, be determined what could then be the cost of the program from a country perspective in terms of preparation by these different entities. And we are not at that stage. We were at the stage where we are only providing a progress report of what we have seen has been the market response when we were requesting the information. And we will come back in future with all those details going forward. And Chair, you are correct that these will need to be looked into uh, at, at, at various times where progress needs to be provided. And we'll provide that progress. Nuclear, by its very nature, is a long-term uh, project. And it requires uh, support of government, support of the stakeholders, closely monitored all over the world in countries that are deploying successfully nuclear power reactor projects. They set up structures that monitors the effectiveness, the, the, the cost on a constant basis. And that's what we also need to be considering in terms of making sure that we come and account to the community, we account to the different structures as to how the project is being undertaken. Uh, very important to emphasize, we are at a non-commercial binding stage. We have not yet started the procurement. We are still investigating the feasibility of the program. And that was the intent of the RFI. And it helped us to that. Then the honorable member Balem raised a point that when you look into the IRP, there is no nuclear in the tables. But also important is that the committee needs to recognize that the IRP contains nine decisions and all of these decisions uh, are being uh, implemented at various stages. And this particular one, decision number eight, speaks precisely on the nuclear new build, the extent of 2,500 megawatts that needs to be start the preparation. And I think also then becomes important to, to note from the committee that the preparation of this type of technology, we, 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 we may not overemphasize the need of starting as early as possible to make sure that come post-2030, the nuclear power plant is able to come online to assist the country in terms of providing base load that will be required. The, the, the honorable members would have noted that based on the market information, it takes six to 10 years to construct a nuclear power plant. And if we look from here to 10 years, so that's well into the early 2030s when the nuclear power plants uh, could be ready to supply the electricity into the grid. And that is why it is important to start the preparations uh, now, because a lot of decisions that will inform the pace at which this, the, 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 and the scale at which the country can uh, implement the program and the affordability thereof can only be determined once the market has been tested, once a commercial process and initiated to really understand what the cost of this technology would be, what the different uh, permutations or possibilities could be that can allow the program to be uh, done uh, and mitigate the cost to the, the country. So it's very important to start with that. So, so the, the, the nuclear new build, it's very important to, to, to appreciate that it is part of decision number eight that is in the IRP and all of the decisions that are in the IRP, they are at the different levels of being implemented by the department. And this is one of them that we are implementing. Uh, then uh, the issue of the nuclear liability that uh, the honorable member Melem emphasized 
uh, what would be the strategy going forward in dealing with now the, the, the nuclear liability, whether the, to put money aside such that that money is available whenever required to deal with this. It, it is a part of the, the fund bill that is putting forward various mechanisms that will be dealing with the issue of uh, nuclear liability. And, and that fund bill is, is at an advanced stage in terms of uh, preparations uh, uh, and taking it forward so that it can uh, be consulted with uh, the, the, the cabinet and, and parliament. The department has uh, worked quite extensively in terms of getting that uh, fund bill ready. Then the honorable member Milam also uh, ask a question whether is it not uh, important that we accelerate the, 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 the investigation work to make sure that the high level radioactive waste is, is, is clearly accommodated to, to make sure that it's in place uh, when we look into expanding the nuclear new build. I think that's a, a, a correct uh, a approach, uh, Honorable Member Mailem. Uh, there are entities that have got the responsibility to deal with this, and, and that's Enradi uh, that is dealing with this. And they are the ones that are undertaking this investigation to make sure that we have a long-term repository uh, for the high-level radioactive waste. And of course, they will have within their expertise have to uh, accelerate the work and making sure that they comply with all the necessary uh, requirements uh, and also their professional requirements that ensure that such a work, the investigations thereof and that the site get proven that it can accommodate this, they undertake that work. So, so that's very important. But it's very also important to under, to, 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 to emphasize that it doesn't mean that there is no solution at this moment. The, 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 the South African nuclear management waste strategy is such that we start from on site where a high level radioactive waste is stored and all these uh, uh, nuclear facilities are designed such that their life span would accommodate the high level radioactive waste that is generated during the design life. And as going forward then, uh, being extended their life, that is why then an offsite storage facility is being uh, investigated and the project is now uh, ongoing through the pre-feasibility study that NRADI is now dealing with. And the long term is when they will uh, look into a deep uh, geological disposal uh, facility which is what the NRAD is dealing with. And the, 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 the chair raised the issue about the capacity of NRAD and other state. I think as we are preparing for this work, all of these state entities will be capacitating themselves to ensure that they can execute their mandate in line with their founding legislation because they have various roles that they have to play into the nuclear program. I uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, DDG. Um, Chair, I just want to, to add to the question um, or the response on the fund bill. Uh, as Mr. Mbambo has indicated that um, we have consulted with a cabinet, there are some comments that have been made by a cabinet and now we have taken uh, this bill to the state law advisor and uh, then after those inputs have been uh, dealt with by the state law advisor, then it will come back and we'll take it uh, back to cabinet. And then after that, we'll start with a, a broader uh, public uh, consultation. And so that is where we are at at the moment in as far as the funding bill is concerned. The other issue, Chair, that you have also raised, it is in relation with other stakeholders. Mr. Mbambo has also covered uh, this. Uh, I just want to um, add uh, that um, ESCOM is uh, keen to participate. As you know, that uh, DMRE is a policy 
development. And so we have given direction and guidance in terms of, of the, the nuclear. Now, ESCOM is also committed in terms of its participation. Uh, it is keen to participate. But uh, as for the modalities, uh, uh, those would be worked out as, and so and, uh, we would always give this guidance as a, as a policy department. The other issue, Chair, that has been raised, which uh, I want to emphasize this point, I know that uh, honorable members are very consistent on this question, is the provision of the 2,500 uh, megawatts in the IRP. Uh, Mr. Mbambo has uh, clarified this point. I just want to add, uh, as you know, that uh, this is actually a massive infrastructure uh, project. And so we are starting as early as now. We don't need to wait up until it is too late. And the issue of the performance agreement of the minister of the 2,500 to be procured by 2024, uh, it simply you know, uh, means that uh, the, the construction uh, for successful bidder or bidders will then have to commence post uh, 2024. Uh, with the understanding that uh, the the next IRP that will come into effect uh, post 2030 will then make the necessary uh, provision in terms of the table uh, as provided now by the IRP 2019, where it would indicate that uh, for nuclear, um, you know, the 2,500 megawatts. Uh, will then come into the grid. I think it's a question that was also raised. It will come into uh, the grid by this date, maybe 20 whatever, 2035 or 2036 as an example. But all those modalities will be uh, worked out. Now, the other issue, Chair, it is also in regard with other stakeholders as we have raised this point. Uh, NERSA has, has also um, been engaged and so if you look in terms of this was also even issued uh, the public consultations that process is starting uh, we understand that uh, as Mr. Mbambo has highlighted this point that uh, an infrastructure project of this magnitude or any infrastructure project I mean you would need to consult with uh, the society um, you know at large and so we know we have taken note of uh, the, 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 the court judgment as well. And so all the stakeholders are being engaged. Uh, I think, Chair, Mr. Mbamba has also covered this point, as we have raised your point around the principal issue, and you raised the issue of a, an IRP process, where uh, decision number eight makes a specific reference to the fact that we we'll then deal with this process in terms of the pace, the scale uh, in which the country can afford. And so here we are saying that there must be an orderly process which will be systematic in terms of how we go about this uh, process of uh, procuring the 2,500 megawatts of uh, nuclear uh, power. And so I think that uh, uh, we, we, we have clarified all the questions I think Mr. Mbambo has also covered the question on cost implications, as he has indicated that, uh, you know, you have also highlighted this point that we are currently at an exploratory stage. And so a lot of work uh, still needs to be done. All this information uh, by the time when we go for requests for, for proposals, it will then actually be available. They have worked out everything. Uh, because we can't go out um, if then uh, we'll still be having those uh, outstanding issues. But then uh, there is actually also that understanding that we account to the PPC on mineral resources and energy, as and when a need arises, of course, will then be maybe required to come and provide you an update in terms of the work that we, we are doing. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. Okay, thank you, DG. Um, look, let, let me start with this one. And I always get worried. Um, but it's okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure, DG. You know, 
this thing that uh, maybe that's how it is. That's okay. I still have to go back again and um, maybe I'm getting older than I'm old. Check this thing uh, because I've seen processes of parliament and at times maybe correctly so or, or whatever, they sound like the delay is with parliament. Now, this uh, funding bill, I hope when it comes, and I'm saying this thing openly, when it comes, it will come and will be sufficient, will allow sufficient time for the committee of parliament to process. I fear that when thing comes, the time given, there's already a time frame that is put and parliament will have just to follow that time frame. Just now in advance, let it be known that we will decide how we handle according to the processes of parliament. Um, 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 because when we invited the, the department to say it must come and present the legislative framework, I don't remember getting this. And um, I hope it's not something that is now, like you say, you know how long it takes when you put a bill. You still have got to process it yourselves there. The second thing probably, thanks for the clarity. It does help to simplify, and, and I always say to people, when you come to the PC, you must be able to be clear what are you pleading, or what are your expectations, or what do you think needs to be done. The PC is not a platform just to criticize, but also the PC is a platform that has to add to the thinking and the work that is being done if that work requires a reinforcement. Obviously, when certain things are not good, we will say so. But also see the PC also to be playing a complementary role that will assist. Now, I want to suggest the following honorable members, that in light of this presentation, one, let's agree that uh, it is not, it is still work in progress, is not, fi not finalized, we will look from time to time when we prepare the program of the committee and also monitor developments as they take place. And we'll then find a way to put it into consideration of the program of the committee. But having said so, uh, in my view, if members allow, we must factor in a way where we, it's not policing, but it must be a necessary requirement for members of parliament, where we can be able, in particular, the following stakeholders to take them into consideration as part of what we will do with one item at that time. One, we, we, we should consider opening up to hear what, what is NERSA's view, not only when we deal with the funding bill, because it's just funding. What, what is NERSA's take on this process? Two, we have to understand what is the attitude or and what is uh, take on this process. Four, we should add ESCOM so that some of these questions we are not told that, uh, no, we had this anticipation. No, we are not questioning TG and your team, whether you are talking or you are not talking to them. But also, we, it's not even us to cover our backs, but it's to make sure that we get all the necessary information as we proceed with the process. We are not saying you can't, you should end or you must end. But we're saying it might be good for these entities so that when we plead, whatever the case that might be, you know, my main worry is which finally, I can't say it now, but I think honorable members, we all know tomorrow is the budget. Even the budget may be able to tell us whether what is being undertaken now, it is possible uh, in relation to what is in the coffers. 
so, so I think it will assist us a lot uh, as a committee to, in the final analysis, to make an informed decision when we have also engaged with these other entities or stakeholders in the context of the work that is being done. Maybe we may even develop an a understanding of the projection. Uh, what is in from their own side, what is the projection that they think uh, will be necessary for, for them to, to, to participate. The danger, most dangerous thing, uh, it's not that we are questioning what you are doing, was sometimes, no, 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 the process is necessary and, and you, are, you are undertaking a correct uh, process. The only problem is that is when you have gone through this process and then somebody comes in at the end and say, ah, yeah, uh, we don't have enough resources. For instance, the point that uh, where I was raising in Honorable Mayland, if Enradi brings us a different uh, understanding and say, no, this can only happen on our side. If you see, you don't have figures, but for us, if we were to get so much in terms of an allocation of the cost on this matter, we could be able to meet a particular requirement in terms of the project uh, uh, output. So those are the things we need to have to get. For them, they may have specific, whilst we are dealing with the exploration so that we understand some of these things. We don't become people who take decisions on the basis of what is being said to us. So there is, there is no questioning on the role that uh, nuclear should play, the role and the knowledge that South Africa has in that space, especially nuclear for, for peaceful purposes. We adopted even the agreements that uh, you came with, you explained, the committee accepted. So that, that, that can't be, that's not the issue. But those who know, they say once beaten, twice shy. So experience has shown that sometimes when things are presented, they, they are presented so good, but down the line, they change the cause uh, of, of what, what could be. So, so, so I think we appreciate your presentation. To some degree, I think for most of the members, we have, uh, uh, like Prof. Simang was saying, we're well, all the same, Prof. We, at least now we've got a sense of what is this thing. We're not going to wake up within a single day and wake up being a nuclear specialist. We, 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 we develop knowledge, we must check, we must go and back and learn and, and relearn. So I think that's what uh, we, were try, we were trying to say. But having said so, is there an agreement, honorable members, that uh, as part of the future progress or whatever on this matter, we should consider also including these other entities, even if they will say for five minutes or 10 minutes so that we can have an understanding of uh, what is they are taking the process. It will help also when that bill comes in, in the consultative processes, we will know now how or which ones may be impacted about this particular bill. Do we agree that we consider also including them? And this matter is not, must not be taken off the, the table. It must be here from time to time. We will see the op where opportunity present itself. We, we bring it on, on board again. Even if we're not starting from the same presentation, but we'll be starting maybe halfway going forward. Is that agreed, honorable members? Who's that now? Is that Honorable Volmarans? It was Mr. Volmarans yesterday. What happened? Because he spoke very well. What happened now is a uh... agreed chair. Okay. Yeah. It's me, chair. Yes, 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 chair. I'm saying, um, uh, yes, I got uh, chair. Yes. And um, okay. I, I, I also think it, it, it will enrich our discussion and uh, understanding for them to be on board under the, that, that item, chair. Uh, it's fully agreed. Okay. We all agreed, honorable members. They say silence means consent. Okay, did you? Uh, you will go no, back sure. and uh, you'll go back and always be ready for the when duty calls. Yes. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, honorable members, can we now go to the minutes? Uh, of the 2nd of December on page one. Number two. Uh, number three. Number four which is adjournment. Okay, any move of the minutes? I move for the adoption of the minutes, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Kula. Any second? Uh? Yeah, second. Thank you, Honorable Mailem. Any matters arising? Yes, Chair. Yes, Mama Umashaule. Chair, can I be assisted that uh, we go to uh, bullet point number three on resolutions? Okay. Uh, maybe a reminder of what information was that that is requested and uh, uh, has it been uh, submitted as it was uh, promised by the, the department? Uh, I'm raising this because if you look at uh, bullet point uh, uh, two, uh, bullet point one of 2.3, pa uh, paragraph two, it says during this meeting, the department was requested to forward information to the committee by Friday, 27 November, 2020. They did the, the department did not forward the requested information. The chairperson stated that this will be the last time the department promised to provide information and then neglect to do so. So I want to, 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 to understand and be reminded what was that information and has it been submitted by the 14th of January as it was agreed, considering that you ruled that it was the last time uh, such information is not brought. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Are you in Sorry, Chair, we just moved. Hello. Before I come in on my own. Chair, can I talk? Yes. No, um, we're just double checking the exact information, but as far as, as I recall, nothing has been received from the department right. since last year. But we, do, we will just fly in what was the information requested. Um, the information that was requested. Uh, okay. In yes. other words, I'm also trying to demonstrate to the, the, the secretaries, the two secretaries that when we write minutes, it is very helpful to, yes. to, to be specific uh, so that you don't have to go to the last minutes of another meeting to understand what was it that was outstanding. I'm deliberately raising it uh, so that the department uh, is held accountable, but also the writers of the minutes uh, make sure that they, 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 they write minutes uh, that make sense to everybody, even uh, when you are new in the committee, you understand what information we're talking about. Thanks. Okay. No, you are, you are correct, uh, Honorable Masaule, because it also assists that the matter does not disappear on the on the on the agenda of the on the agenda of the committee. Uh, 
Are you getting it? Uh... Yes, Chair, we're getting it. Yes. Help us so that we can help you. Chair, it yes. relates to that information of uh, which Mrs. Phillips requested with regard to that one site. Um, that was the information that was requested, Chair. She, she was looking for an update of how far they are with regard to um, inspecting that site um, with regard to the illegal mining or the closing of one of the shafts, Chair. Mm. Yes. So that was the information that they were supposed to. It has not been, has it been received? I've checked my records now. I haven't received anything here. Maybe Carmichael can also assist us in this regard, Chair, as he's the one who's sending out the information. We might have missed it or we might have not received it. Carmichael is in the meeting. Can he assist? What I know, the information, uh, uh, Honorable uh, uh, One, was the one with regards to the issue of the illegal mining and the sites. Two, because it says all, not just what was discussed only. In fact, so, so, so supposed to correct all the information, you see, um, all the outstanding information that has been requested from the department. And that was in the resolution of the, on the, of the 24th, including that exercise. And as far as I know, that was never received um, at that stage. Um, but uh, like they say, if the if this is uh, not a fact, then uh, they can it can be dis it can be disputed. One, let me let me show you. I remember one was that uh, we need that uh, stats. They must forward the steps to the committee on the SA diamonds output on the continent and globally. Employment figures in the industry relating to black women, youth, and persons with disability. Transformation of the management in the diamond sector with specific reference to black women and persons with disability. Uh, uh, information in relation to derelict mines that has to be forwarded to the committee by 27 November. And uh, that's it. But in addition to this, which is why it said so, uh, in addition to this, why were also the issue that uh, Honorable Philip had requested, not just on the asbestos, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, uh, illegal mining, but also it related to outstanding information with the committee needed on the issue of the, 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 the asbestos sites, those that were closed and those that were still outstanding. <clears throat> that is what it says, but you are correct, Honorable Mashaule, if there is reference to the, if there is reference to, to, to the date or the contents of minutes, it must be clear what are those issues that are related to the minute. minute. That one I commit, we will, we will correct it. Uh, DG, uh, I don't know where now I see it has been sent. Can you agree that uh, 
Ayanda, if you received it, I have not seen it. I don't want to lie. But I see the DJ has just sent it. Uh, I don't know. Um, can we forward it also to members if now? And then if members, let members be allowed that um, because this matter arises on the minutes of the 2nd of December, that this matter remains outstanding. And in the minutes now, when we write Ari and Ayanda, that the committee on matters arising had to deal with the outstanding information of the minutes of the 24th of November, 2020. And therefore, members will be allowed to raise issues with regards to that outstanding information of the minutes of the 24th of November, 2020. Will that suffice, honorable members? So that uh, we can quiz you now on this matter. Uh, we can, when we deal with minutes of this meeting, we will have to deal with that, with that outstanding information because no longer matters arising now. Do we agree? That's fine, Jim. Yes. So when we deal with the minutes of the, with the, with the minutes of today, we will, this will also must reflect when we deal with matters arising on the outstanding issues, and then it will be this information. But I'm not sure whether this is only limited to this the diamond. I see only the diamond. I still have to, 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 to see it. Uh, we will check whether it did arrive. Maybe those secretaries did not see the information or Someone did not do the work again. It might have been sent DG to the department, but we will talk on the side if how did this because I, I've never seen this information. Sorry, but Chair, I, can I just sorry, Chair? Yeah, I just yeah. wanted to do the information that we received on the 18th of January, which the DG signed on the 15th. That is only responding to Miss Phillips' uh, information. I just wanted that to members. The other information. We never received it about the state diamond and so forth. Now leave it. Let's let's not bother. Let's not bog down the meeting on the on this. We will deal with it and we'll give response to the committee. We are also equally accountable to this committee. So we will do that, honorable members. We will we will deal with the issue aside. It's an administrative matter. We'll deal with it aside and then uh, but in the meantime. Uh, we will forward you all the information we're receiving in the department. Let's deal with that information when we deal with the minutes under matters arising of the 23rd of February 2021. I nearly said 2020. Okay, in the absence of any other matter, can we now go uh, flight uh, read the minutes of uh, um, as in our been uh, The minutes of the 10th. Number one. Two. Three. And four. And five, any, and six, and seven. Okay. Any matters arising, honorable members? Yes, Chairperson. Oh, no, 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 sorry. Chair, chair, and, 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 and any move of the minutes? I, I, I do, Chairperson. Okay. Honorable any second?
I second the move, uh, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Langa, you wanted to raise matters arising? Uh, that's correct, Chairperson. Thank you. Um, yeah. It's on page uh, or on point number five. Uh, you would recall that you <coughs> uh, tabled uh, that there was apparently uh, correspondence that was received from interest groups and one correspondence was sent by the office of the speaker as it reflects on the minute number five, right? Then mm. the resolution of the committee was to refer all correspondences to the department for response prior to the committee engaging on them. So now, so that we are consistent uh, with such matters, we need to make follow-ups. So I just need to check with, uh, with uh, uh, through you, Chairperson, uh, uh, with the department if if uh, uh, if the correspondence was uh, referred to them. If so, when was this, and what was the response uh, uh, by the department? Thank you, Chair. Okay. Maybe let's say, let, let's assist. The, the correspondence was sent, has been sent. The only thing is not only to, to, to DMRE. It was also supposed there was a correspondence with regards to the outstanding audit outcomes of some of the entities under DMRE, which were supposed to be processed. I think it's supposed to say so, which were supposed to be processed by uh, the AG's office. That correspondence has been sent both to the department and uh, to, to, to the AG's office. Uh, what I know is that the AG's office has acknowledged the receipt of the, of the, of the correspondence, but they have not responded. The department um, has confirmed that uh, how many of those entities um, three chair. Yeah. Yes. Three. Which, which, which of those was? Uh, uh, Narwadi, Nersa, yeah. and Sanedi. The outstanding ones is the Safe Group and uh, Nexa Group chair. Yes. Now remember what what also was agreed was that as and when they have been tabled, we will then look at it when we do the program we will include them uh, in the program for the second quarter uh, because it already adopted. But if there is a possibility to get a, 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 a space before, before the end of this quarter, if we were to be, they will be highly prioritized with regards to that. Uh, so, so, so it's that. The dilemma that we are having is that the minister tomorrow is, is putting the budget, is uh, delivering the budget speech. And uh, we will then start with this process of somewhere there on the second quarter. And I'm not sure, that's an issue that maybe, I am not don't know whether we can distend. Thanks, th thanks Honorable Laga to bring this. I don't know whether we can discuss this now or we discuss it uh, at a certain platform. Um, how do we deal with this thing? Because I find it very difficult that we can, uh, we can deal with the budget of entities that have not accounted for how they've used what was given, if there was any, or how they've used what they had, even if it was generated by them. So, but on all those that have tabled, we will be looking for the date. Uh, uh, one other thing that uh, we have a dilemma, uh, but we are working on it. I thought the committee had given us a mandate was now in the with the problems that we are having with the AG to 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 confer with the chairperson responsible for the AG uh, on this anomaly, which is not something that uh, we are used to uh, in terms of accountability. The AG we have always worked very well with them, but uh, we think this is. This is too much because 
this information that we have even on those other entities it doesn't come from the AG's office. It comes from the department that uh, those are done, which means there are others outstanding. With regards to the rest of the correspondence, no, we said the correspondence, uh, I remember, uh, sorrow, honorable Milam, I'm not picking you up. The issue is that how do you deal with the, those correspondence it must be sent to, sent to the department before and, and to members so that when we deal with them, some of those issues relate to the licensing regime. It's complaints with regards how the department, the issues relating to the department on licensing, either mining or, 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 or um, what you call it, energy. Uh, now, remember the department is coming back tomorrow. We said as part of their presentation on the licensing regime, they will have to respond to that, those correspondences that have been sent to them. So we're not expecting them to write back to us. We're sending them, giving them so that when they come, they must be able to account even on those correspondences, which is why we said they must also be sent to members so that members, if they want to reference in that, those presentations tomorrow, they will use those complaints also as a basis uh, of, 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 of of the, of, of the, of, of the, of, of, of the complaints, because the, the reason we put the issue of the licensing regime, it was based on the fact that almost all members were complaining, including myself, who I'm sitting with, sitting with correspondences of people who are complaining about how the, the, the licensing or their licensing requests are being handled by the department. So tomorrow we are dealing with the issue, Honorable Langa. We hope the department will be able now to also include and respond on those on, the, on those issues that were raised uh, 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 by by other members. The last one is the one the, from the speaker, which we also sent to the department. They will be able to respond, or we hope tomorrow. But most importantly, that is uh, people who also request a meeting, which uh, I don't think we have got to decline. The only thing when we correspond to the speaker is that we are looking for a, a date because we've already uh, populated our first quarter program. So we are looking just on a date where, when we can we accommodate that exercise and hear them. They've got, uh, they've made a request. They believe that they, they deserve a hearing. And I think this committee is within its right based on the instruction of the speaker. And that's what we are, going, we are corresponding to with the speaker that we're looking for a date where we will meet with, uh, with the group. I don't know whether I'm putting it correct, Ari, my summary of the response or accountability. No, that's fine, Chair. Yeah, that is the answer, honorable members. Well, yeah, Chair, just quickly, the correspondence was sent to the AG and the department. Um, the, uh, when was that meeting on the 10th? I think the correspondence was sent on the 11th chair. Okay. Any other matter, honorable members? Chair? Okay. Yes, honorable uh, Mailem? So it's not relating to the, the minutes. I'm, I'm happy with the minutes. Um, but could, could I just ask that uh, the secretaries distribute a program for the weekend? Oh, yes. No, no. You're 100% correct. Thank you, Chair. No, it will be done. In fact, it's supposed to be out there now. Yeah. No, we'll send it. Try, 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 try and check your, your inboxes. Is that inboxes or what? <laughs> That thing that you would not have opened it yet with the information, maybe it's already there. Uh, honorable members, I was going to go on that matter, uh, but uh, we still have got a day tomorrow. Uh, let's meet tomorrow uh, for the presentation. And then... Uh, we still have got work over the weekend, those uh, who have uh, confirmed. In the absence of any other matter with regards to the issues of today, thank you very much, honorable members.
Um, and uh, you welcome all those others. Thank you very much for, 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 for your inputs. You have assisted uh, very much. Hope to see you tomorrow. At least I gave you some extra few minutes uh, to spare, five minutes earlier. Thank you very much. The meeting stands adjourned. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> so wonderful. Hello, Mama Linga. Happy. Happy to be here. And so was. Bona Friday. Mr. Malin. I hope you are doing well. You went along. You went along. You went along. How's it, Paisa? Hi, hey, how's it? it? How's 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 it?